So what about the Bible? How does it stand up to our four-step test? What about John 20, verse 1, where it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. However, if you go over to Matthew's account of the exact same event, Matthew 28, 1, it reads, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Someone once pointed out to me that this was a clear contradiction because John only tells about the one Mary that went to the tomb, while Matthew, on the other hand, tells us about two Marys that went to the tomb. <laughs> However, if you go back and look at John 20 verse 2 more closely, John clears up that Mary, along with someone else, came running back to Peter and said, we don't know where they have taken him. Clearly, it's not a contradiction. I've seen lists containing literally hundreds of such supposed contradictions in the Bible, and all just like this one can easily be straightened out just by reading the text a little more carefully. Again, the law of contradiction says that A cannot be both A and non-A at the same time, place, and manner. It must meet those qualifications in order to be a true contradiction. For thousands of years, people have been trying to find such a true contradiction in the Bible and have yet to ever find one. Not a single one. Think for a moment about what a miracle that is. Only when you examine the uniqueness of this book can you truly appreciate the miracle of not one contradiction. The Bible in its entirety from Genesis to Revelation was written over a 1500 year span, written over 40 generations with 40 different authors, people from all walks of life, kings to peasants, philosophers to fishermen written on three different continents in Asia, Africa, and Europe. During times of war and times of peace, written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Its subject matter includes hundreds of controversial topics. Yet the biblical authors all spoke in complete harmony beginning to end. The unfolding story of God's redemption of man. That's a miracle. So what about science? Doesn't the Bible fail the science test since it claims that life was created rather than evolved? That the earth is relatively young and also that it once was completely flooded by a worldwide global flood. Well, again, I want to point out how I had said earlier that in order to fail this test, it must fail known science. It must be something we know to be a fact as opposed to popular theory. For example, we know that there isn't an atmosphere on the moon so that no human life could possibly live there. Not only that, we've actually traveled there. Regarding evolution, I've already pointed out that far from being a known fact, it is rather only a popular theory. No one has ever observed something evolve, nor has anyone ever found a finally graduated chain of fossils. Nor has anyone ever observed new beneficial information being added to the DNA of a multi-celled organism. What is actually physically observed is advanced life showing up suddenly in the fossils looking much as it does today. When we observe the function of DNA, we see something that is highly specified. So even if you don't agree that life must have been created, you must at least agree that evolution is far from being a known scientific fact. As for the complaint that raises the issue regarding the age of the earth, I must point out again that no human has been around long enough to tell us for certain how old it is. So the most we could possibly do is observe how long certain processes take and then try to come up with an educated guess on the age. Sort of like walking past a closed restaurant seen a guy inside peeling potatoes. We could calculate how long it takes him to peel one potato and then take those times the number of peeled potatoes that we observe and come up with a rough guess as to how long he's been there peeling potatoes. I realize that this is an extreme oversimplification, but this is the basic concept behind all dating processes. Again, you don't need to flood your brain with all of this scientific jargon if you just grasp that this is the basic principle that all dating methods employ. 
but consider how none of them take into account several important factors that would drastically affect our time calculations. For example, did the potato peeler start out moving much faster and then slow down to its current rate? Maybe he got tired. Or what if he recently sped up much faster? Maybe he decided he was in a hurry to get the job done. What if prior to our arrival he had had several other people helping him peel potatoes? Or what if he didn't start with zero potatoes, but rather he started with several buckets of already peeled potatoes and had just recently sat down? You can see how changing any one of these would greatly change our time calculations. The same problems arise with all of today's dating methods. The point again is that it is far from being a known science. What if fossils don't really take millions of years to form? but rather could actually form in merely hundreds of years. What if many creatures claimed to have been extinct for millions of years were actually found to have lived in recent human history or to even still be alive today? What if cave stalactites and stalagmites could actually form in only decades as opposed to millions of years? What if much of the world's strata layers thought to have taken millions of years to form could actually have been laid down in only a matter of minutes during a catastrophic worldwide flood? What if the current drift rate of the moon and the slowdown of the Earth's rotation and the current decay rate of the Earth's protective magnetic field just made an old Earth impossible? What if God really did cause starlight to instantaneously reach us from 14 and a half billion light years away? just as the Bible says. The fact of the matter is that there's not a single shred of known, and I must stress known, science that conflicts with what the Bible teaches. There are only educated guesses and unsubstantiated theories made popular by the media. What we find when we compare the Bible with known science is not only does it agree with science, but it in many ways passes up known science. Let me explain that. I find that there are scientific principles in the Bible which no authors of the time which it was written could have possibly known. One example of this is a star cluster known as the Star Cluster Pleiades. The Star Cluster Pleiades, or also known as Seven Sisters, is a group of at least 200 stars. The Larousse Encyclopedia of Astronomy says that there may be as many as 500 or more stars within this cluster. Some just can't be photographed and others are behind other stars that make it impossible to photograph. The star cluster is called Pleiades, meaning seven, because of the seven stars which can be seen by the naked eye. Yet what you can't see is the fact that this group of stars is actually moving together through space as a cluster. And one might be able to even say bound together. Yet it is mentioned in the scriptures. Under its Hebrew name, it's called Kama, which is literally means accumulation or heat, a term more closely related to the word cluster. In Job 38, verse 31, God says to Job, Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? The concept here of this group of stars being bound together couldn't possibly have been known by anyone during the time of Job. Yet there it is in scripture, thousands of years before the invention of photography. Likewise, the ancient scriptures mention the sun's motion through the universe in Psalms 19, 5 through 6, at a time when all the ancients thought that the sun was stationary. Job 38, 19 mentions the motion of light particles and the static nature of darkness long before scientists like Isaac Newton and Christian Polgans ever suggested the concepts. Ecclesiastes 1.7, Jeremiah 10.13, they both mention the Earth's hydrologic water cycle, thousands of years before the experiments of Pierre Perrault and Edme Marriott demonstrated it. The Earth's wind belts and its behavior were not discovered until the works of George Hadley and G.G. Corrales and William Farrell in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Yet the wind belts and its behavior were clearly described thousands of years earlier in Ecclesiastes 1.6. Early beliefs about the 
ocean's floor were that, that they were flat and barren, much like the bottom of a lake. Yet in Jonah 2, 3 through 6, it describes mountains in the depths of the oceans, long before the first oceanographers of the 19th century ever discovered them. The spherical nature of the earth was described in Isaiah 40:22 and Proverbs 8, 27. And then it was reaffirmed by Jesus himself in Luke 17, 34 through 36. And I would point out that Jesus lived at a place and time in the Roman providence when the popular scientific opinion was that the earth was flat. In the Bible, one can find examples of germ sterilization and quarantine procedures, procedures that were not adopted by modern medical hospitals until the early 19th century. There are references of atomic matter and altogether unknown science until modern times. There are literally hundreds of scientific concepts in the Bible that were centuries, even millenniums before their times. The Bible goes above and beyond all expectations of agreeing with modern science and passes the science test and pointing to a divine inspiration.